All right? So, um, if you remember, we start, we ended last lecture with sort of having a derivation of uh, uh, power, which was quite generic, worked for an orbitary algebraic structure and could do things really fast in a sense, doing almost optimal number of operations and optimizing secondary operations. So, uh, of course, the question is, which many of you might have asked, is why would anybody care whether you raise something in seventh power optimally or suboptimally, you know, uh, well, if it were just raising an integer into seventh power, you would be correct. Probably nobody would care. The problem is that first, people do raise things in very large powers, where very large means digits are uh, the numbers with, say, 100 digits, right? And then doing it optimally makes sense, or at least not doing, not attempting to, to do it in a naive way, because believe it or not, even with fast modern computers, uh, doing 10 to the 100 operations will take a while. Second of all, sometimes the operations which we do with the power are very heavy operations. They are not just multiplying two integers. They might be operation on large objects. And specifically, they are often, for very many algorithms, happen to be matrix multiplication, right? Where matrix multiplication is an expensive operation, much more expensive than multiplying two integers. So you say, why, what, what are these algorithms? And uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through several classical examples of applying exponentiation to uh, different matrices, where, again, matrices are defined over different semi-ring structures. I'll tell you what it means. And then, as the main example, again, we will go back to using integers, except we are going to be talking about very, very, very large integers. Again, the main example during this journey is going to be uh, the encryption, and specifically RSA encryption, and uh, we will need to, to learn a little bit of very, very beautiful math in order to be able to do it. So, uh, first problem. Uh, I, I am certain that all of you heard of Fibonacci numbers, and some of you might have heard the origin of, of uh, how, how somebody wanted to breed rabbits and came up with the sequence. Uh, we're going to encounter Fibonacci himself in our third journey. So, you know, I have to do interesting sort of things. I have to sometimes not to tell you some wonderful story because I have some other place for it, which I think is more important. I couldn't just preload all the stories up front. So just be patient. We will learn about him. He was a wonderful guy. Uh, these are the sequence. So 0, 1, 1. Of course, he started with 1 in the sequence, first Fibonacci number. But since that time, we extended the sequence with 0 Fibonacci number, which is 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. Many, 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 but they go on forever, as you well know. And they're based on a very simple recurrence, which is if we know one Fibonacci number and the next, we could compute the third. So it takes a window of two numbers to compute the third one. And therefore, if we know first two, which we do, zero and one, we could keep going forever and forever and forever, computing more and more and more. Of course, classical sort of naive question, how many steps does it take to get to the nth Fibonacci number? Well, and self-evident answer, self-evident answers are not always correct, is n minus two. 
right? To get to to the number, I mean, you need you need to uh, basically do linear number of steps. Of course, all of you, I have to do it. Uh, all of you seen this, and there are like famous universities where they spend a long time explaining to you that if you use a technique called memoization, you could make this faster. Well, let's leave this discussion to these famous universities uh, and memoization uh, with it. So obviously, this is a very, very bad code. If you don't believe me, try it. It does terminate theoretically. So the reason is that, of course, we're going to be recomputing the same things over and over and over and over again. And there is a homework which you need to do is to figure out how many additions are needed to compute the Fibonacci this and Fibonacci number this way. So you see, for example, when we compute five, we need to compute four and three. For four and three, we need to compute sum of three and two and two and one, which it sort of gives two and one plus one and zero plus one and zero. You know, they, they sort of rec get recomputed and recomputed and recomputed again. So the, the problem of sort of figuring out exact complexity is a nice problem. Try it. So uh, there is, of course, very simple fix. You don't need to do memorization. If you just want something which terminates slowly, you could just rewrite it iteratively. It will take n steps to go and sort of compute the Fibonacci number. Here I make it on purpose. I should have said there is a bug nobody tells me. Uh, STD pair and STD make pair. Uh, please send me email complaining. I'll fix it. Uh, so the, the idea of the algorithm is very, very simple. You keep these two things as your state, two Fibonacci numbers, and then at every step you slide the window. You sort of, you make your second into first, and you make your sum of the first and second into the second. And you keep going. Very simple code, does work. Takes n time, n steps. But of course, it's still quite inept. The problem is that there is a much, much faster algorithm for doing it. The amazing thing, we could compute n Fibonacci number in approximately log n steps. And for those of you who forget, log n is much, much smaller than n. Sort of n could be very big. Log n is less than 64. Well, some of you say, no, 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 it's mathematically not correct. There are logs greater than 64. They are, but not at a 9. <laughs> right? Sort of as long as we run computers, which we have, we're pretty much limited by 64. And for those of you who sort of want to, to, to figure out uh, how uh, slow logging, there is even slower function, which is called log log, which is a very small constant, except it goes to infinity, but only mathematically. And finally, of course, I have to tell you, there is, as it were, the slowest possible growing function, which is known as inverse of Ackerman function, which appears in uh, one of the papers by Bob Tarjan, which is, a, as it were, an infinite stack of logs. And amazingly enough, that it also grows to infinity. But that's strictly theoretical. Log is a very s slow function. If we could reduce n to log n, we are in very good shape. And it is, by the way, utterly counterintuitive. When I, the first time when I heard that you could do Fibonacci recurrence in log n steps, I immediately started proving that it's impossible. <laughs> because how could you get, how could you do n steps in log n steps? It seems to be 
Impossible. Twice it happened to me. This is, was the first case. The even earlier case was then when people told me about Strassen algorithm, which was sometime in sort of very early 70s. He did it in the late 60s, but I haven't heard of it. I, again, I decided immediately go and prove that it was impossible. Spent about two days and finally figured out how it worked. Uh, so, but there are certain things which are sort of counterintuitive. And the idea of doing Fibonacci faster are based on, again, sort of instead of thinking how to modify our loop or some what is known as hacking. That's what they do at Facebook. Right? They have everywhere there is a big sign, hack. And uh, if you hack, you will never discover anything like that, I promise. So here the idea is that instead of hacking, you try to place the problem in a mathematical context. You try to see, remember that we observed that our state is a pair of one Fibonacci number followed by the next. Right? And we want to see what is this transformation of going from one step to the next step. And those of you who remember matrix multiplication might recognize that indeed that's what it is. If you have a pair, a vector size 2 of uh, of two Fibonacci numbers, if we m multiply this vector by this matrix, we slide it one step ahead, right? Because when we multiply it by this row, 1, 1, it will add them. When we multiply it by this row, it will just select this one. Right? So it's, it's a very, very nice sort of Application of multiplication of matrix sake. Well, but then you need to apply this matrix multiplication in minus two times. Right? Yes. Except there is this wonderful, wonderful thing which we know. Here again, I wish I could also teach you linear algebra, very important subject, but I'll assume that you know just a little bit and remind you that if you multiply vector by matrix, multiply by matrix, what you could do is you could multiply matrices and then multiply vector by matrix. So what I could do, I need to look at it like so. I need to say that in order to get to the nth position, I need to multiply this vector to this matrix raised to n minus 1 power. Okay? And then I have to remember one very, very important thing from linear algebra that matrices give me a multiplicative monoid. Remember multiplicative monoid? That's what I have. And if I have multiplicative monoid, I could use my wonderful power algorithm, right? And compute this instead of n minus 1 steps in log n steps, which sort of, it's mind-boggling because it's not, it's not immediately clear. I mean, how do you get that? Well, if you think about it, when you raise this power, this matrix into second power, it gives you a matrix which jumps by step two through this chain of numbers. When you raise it to the fourth power, it gives you a matrix which gives you a recurrence from the first to the fifth. When you end so on. So when you compute this thing, you actually shorten the chain and you get to a logarithmic computation. It's very, very important. Uh, so we, we use this power algorithm to get n Fibonacci number. And you say, well, nobody is right. Mind wants to compute Fibonacci numbers. First of all, it's not quite true. There are perfectly sane people who do, uh, but not often. <laughs> but what is surprising is that we could immediately generalize this result. Because what is Fibonacci? 
Fibonacci is a linear recurrence, a particular kind of relation which is how to obtain something from the previous elements by applying some linear function. Right? Because addition is a linear, you remember what linear function is. No, no squares, no cubes. So, uh, by the way, uh, reading assignment. Uh, we put, uh, again, we do not require, we do not require uh, that you read the OAP, but we just put uh, two pages uh, 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 on the website, on the wiki, uh, and it's actually worthwhile reading these two pages, even if you do not intend to read, read the whole book, because it treats it with some greater details than I do it in the course. And then what it shows there, and I'll show it here, is that you actually could do the following thing. If you have a linear rec recurrence function, which is just a linear function, linear combination of k guys, and if you start this linear recurrence with original k elements, it goes chuck, 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 computing more and more and more, right? And now for any linear recurrence, we could use exactly the same technique and compute the nth element in the linear, any linear recurrence by, in log n steps, by doing matrix multiplication. Because if we look at it, again, this is our original elements. This is a vector of original elements. We multiply it by a matrix, which as, as its first row, our linear recurrence. It actually will do the linear combination. And then it has sort of this diagonal, low, I mean, one-off diagonal uh, sequence of ones, which basically do a shift down, which will sort of replace k minus 2 with k minus 1, k minus 3 with k minus 2, uh, x0 with x1, sort of shift them down. Right? So if we could do one step, again, we do exactly this uh, thing by raising it to, to the nth power with log n steps and compute it much faster. Uh, this particular matrix multiplication could be optimized and again, sort of for those of you who are very interested in it, there is a wonderful paper by my old and now sadly dead friend Chuck Fiducia uh, called Inefficient Formula for Linear Recurrences. Uh, a lot of this stuff I learned from him. He was a great guy. He was a great guy. So what did we see? Again, that was just an example of using matrices. It's a one, matrices are wonderful. Actually, people who do IR discovered that a while back. Uh, and matrices are indeed very, very important. And what we could do, we could reduce many algorithms to this general pattern, finding something which looks like matrix multiplication, then raising matrix in that sort of generalized matrix multiplication to the nth power and presto the problem is solved. So I'll do a couple, there are many many more, but here what I want to show again that very often what we need to do, we need to sort of squint and find different matrix multiplication, not just multiplication which uses numbers and uses plus and times. Right? Normal matrix multiplication uses plus and times. You first you multiply two vectors element by element and then you add the, re the results, right? You do what is known as an inner product, right? And you do an inner product n squared times. Let's ignore for a second uh, Strassen algorithm. And with the n cube operations, you, you could do matrix multiplication. So uh, 
this is in a product, right? So you add corresponding things. And to uh, multiply vector by matrix, you do linear time vector products for. You multiply a vector by every row of the matrix. Just a quick reminder. I know that you all remember that. And matrix matrix products, it's just you multiply row vector, uh, row by columns. Uh, and square. I'm talking about just square matrices here. Of course, mathematicians know how to multiply rectangular matrices, but that's less interesting. But the interesting thing, and that's, that is something which we need to learn to do time and time again. We need to sort of say, okay, mathematicians could do it with plus and times, but what do they really need from plus and times? Do they, do they really want them to be plus and times? And what we realize when we look at what they do is now they just need two operations, something which we will call provisionally something like plus. You put it in a circle and it becomes something like plus, and then something which looks like times, but it's not really times. We assume always that plus is associative and commutative, we do not have to assume commutativity for times. But we have to assume distributivity. We have to assume that, oops, pardon me. We have to assume that when we multiply A by B plus C, it is equivalent to A times B, whatever times and means, plus A times C. And the other way, sort of right and left distributivity. So if we have this, we could populate our, and the object like that is called a semi-ring. In general, mathematicians do the following thing. People always ask me, so why semi-group? Because you see, first they invent something, group. Remember, Galois invented group. And then they discover 100 years after the fact that sometimes they don't really need a full group. So say we need roughly half the group. That's why semi-group. The same thing with the ring. Of course, mathematicians first invented rings. And then after a while, they realized occasionally they need roughly half of what rings provide, so they call them semi-rings. It comes from the fact that people do not really invent things from bottom up, but sometimes they invent a powerful thing and then weaken it. So this is where semi come, come from. Uh, so we got semi-rings, and let us see examples of what we could do with uh, semi-rings. For example, there is a wonderful algorithm called transitive closure. And uh, many of you heard of transitive closure in the context of, say, something like seven degree of separation. And everybody, you know. So a friend of my friend is my friend, I wish. Uh, but, you know, if we assume that there is a relation, relation has transitivity, and we want to close the relation by making, indeed, friends of friends our friends. And how do we do it? We literally could do it mat matrix multiplication over a certain kind of a semi-ring. This is, what do we do? We take n by n matrix, the n people, and it says who is immediately friend of whom. And then matrix multiplication. You take my row, which contains ones for all of my friends, zero for people I know nothing about. And you multiply it by, say, Paul's column. So I go through Paul and connect with all the people through one step who are Paul's friends. Now they become my friends. Right? So uh, if I, what do I need to do? I need to replace plus and times with a very similar operations called or and end. So I should use what is known as a Boolean semi-ring. And again, 
moving, moving the problem to a different semi ring, I could just lift the whole set setting. I mean, matrices are just matrices. Matrix multiplication is just my matrix multiplication. The same code. Well, if my code was written properly, of course. And then I need to raise it to the nth power because if I have n guys, the, well, pardon me, n minus one power, because the longest chain from me to somebody could be n minus one. But raising it to n minus one power, I could again do in logarithmic number of steps. Okay. Here, let us look at something even more strange. There are things called mathematicians sometimes love to introduce really hot concepts. So recently, they introduced the notion of a tropical semi-ring. You know, it comes from Brazil. Uh, it's indeed, I mean, it was sort of, it existed in computer science, by the way, for decades, and they paid no attention. And then a Brazilian mathematician uh, started using this thing for algebraic geometry. And obviously, you know, computer science application is just nobody cares. The moment they start applying it to algebraic geometry, it became very cool. And they named, since he was from Brazil, they in invented this concept of a tropical semi ring. So you should feel really, you know, samba or whatever they do there. Uh, so how could we do shortest path? Again, let us take, let's take n by n matrix, where in every position there is a distance, be how you long it takes if you drive from me to say Tom. And uh, of course, these are immediate roads, direct roads. But there could be a road, you go to Tom, from Tom to Param, and so on and so on. Right? So we want to learn to compute shortest path. And again, it could be done using matrix multiplication over a tropical semi-ring. This is something you could use on a date. Right? <laughs> uh, you know, I'm using matrix to multiplication over tropical semi-rings. Wow. Uh, try it. Uh, so let us see how it works. Tropical semi-ring, it's actually an amazing semi-ring. Because what it does, it replaces multiplication with plus and plus with min. Sort of, they're, they're sort of totally different operations. And let us think about, indeed, just one step of matrix multiplication. So we have my row going to Tom. Actually, my, my row going to any, any, anyone. And then we multiply it from, uh, by a column where it is a, uh, distances from going from everyone to, say, Tom. Right? So when we multiply them according to these tropical laws, what do we do? We pairwise, for every possible position, we add. We say, how long does it take to go from me to Tom through Bill. So my multiplication is plus. So as a result, we assemble a long vector, n guys, of how long does it take of going to Tom through different people, right? And then we use the second part of inner product. We do multiplication, which is in our case is mean. And we find the shortest two-step path from me to Tom. Right? And then we need, of course, to raise this matrix with this multiplication to the power n minus 1 because the, the, sort of the longest path I need to consider is n minus 1. 
I might have to get to, to I'm to literally go through all of you guys before I get to you. But again, it will take log n steps. It's wonderful. It's wonderful for me, it's less wonderful for you. Because that's your homework. Okay? So it is instructive. Try doing it. Even uh, another thing, by the way, uh, people say, well, but I don't have enough time to do the homework this week. Granted. But these are things which you can keep doing for years to come, guys. <laughs> this, these are very nice problems. Many of them are really worth doing. So, Pardon me? In an exact number of steps. But it tends to, the question is that I do exactly the same number of steps, which apparently is the property of four shortest path algorithms, if you think about it. Sort of one of the sort of property, let's say, uh, Big Dijkstra's algorithm. What do you do? I mean, the mo most modern representation, you take all the edges, throw them into priority queue, and then pop them one by one. I mean, you still have to do it. It's sort of, you literally have to consider, a, till, you are not done till you are done. There might be a shorter path. There might be, the last edge might just sort of affect, affect the, the calculation. It's a peculiar property. Yeah, but in practice, I probably want to also um, if I'm interested in the distance from i to j, I probably want to examine the i j element of the result matrix for all of the uh, n minus 1 results. Why would you want? Uh, if I could get there faster in two steps than in n minus 1 steps, wouldn't I prefer that? You would, but you don't know that. Okay, the, the question is, why wouldn't I stop at two steps? No, that's not the question. That would be Yes. <laughs> no, that's not my question. Never mind, never mind. Well, the question that is, is not my when you raise it to the n minus 1 power, the result is the result saying, here are the distances if I go from u to tom in n minus 1 steps. N no, no, it's not the result because it is not the result because you held self loops. Right. No, these are not. Thank you, Param. But I'm gets extra credit. So uh, again, if you attempt to implement it, you again will 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 see this stuff. Uh, those of you who want to read good treatment of these algorithms in this context, there is a very old and very reliable book by Aha Hopcroft and Dolman on algorithms, which, which actually still uses things like semi-rings. They, then they sort of disappeared from, from the discourse. OK, now I tortured you so for some exciting stories. Time for stories. Remember, we have to go back to the Greeks. And here we start with a very remarkable man uh, who literally changed the world. Sort of in some sense, there was a person who changed the world more so than many great emperors and uh, more destructive sort of kind. So let's see what we know about him. Well, we know his name, and some of you probably heard that he proved certain theory. He did much more than that. So let me tell you about him, and again, it is my approximation to the story. Remember the deal I'm telling you, my view of the things. My view tends to be based on scholarly research. So I'm not just making stories up, but I'm ignoring some things and emphasizing some other things, as one should. So what we know about him, and that nobody could deny that, while we might not know exactly that he was born in 570, but approximately that time, we know with any, without any doubt where he was born. He was born in a beautiful island in Aegean Sea called Samos. 
Samos, which at that time, for mysterious reason, became one of the great power centers of Mediterranean. It required a very powerful fleet, and the tyrant of Samos, his name was Polycrates, was one of the great rulers regarded by everyone. Uh, we still could see evidence of his great rule if we go there or if we have Google. If you Google Samus Tunnel, you will see an utterly astonishing engineering marvel which was constructed there right at that time, which is a water tunnel going through one kilometer of solid rock which was cut from both sides and they were off by a couple of feet, which how do you do it? It's even now sort of pretty amazing. It was an engineering marvel. People still go and look and open their mouths because even today it would be a pretty marvelous, marvelous feat. So, but they had fleet, they had money, they had probably more sophisticated technology than, than the rest of the thing. And he became so sure of himself that he literally thought that he was sort of the greatest person on earth. Not Pythagoras. It's the boss, Polycrates. And, uh, you know, Greeks considered certain quality to be the worst, the deadliest. What was the quality? Hubris. Sort of. And the, the canonical example of Hubris was Polycrates, and he was immortalized in some beautiful poems, for example, by Friedrich Schiller. If you look at Schiller and Polycrates, you would find a beautiful poem. But this poem is based on one of the oldest stories which we know about how mighty, how mighty fall, uh, which is recorded in, in uh, Herodotus, the first historian. Greeks, for everything, they had first, including first historian. So the first historian, Herodotus, tells us the following story. I mean, it has nothing to do with anything, but you must know it. Uh, so it's about the ring of Polycrates. So he was so fortunate, he was winning all the battles, that his friend, the pharaoh, who was his friend, sent him a letter, said, look, you are just so lucky that it cannot last. Take something which is really precious to you and throw it into the sea. So Polycrates had this beautiful ring, just which he cherished more than any of his possessions. So he takes the ring, he goes to the cliff, and he throws it into the sea. And now he is certainly safe. He sacrificed his precious possession. The next day in the morning, his cook runs to him and he says, Master, you wouldn't believe it. The fish. They got the fish to the cook. The cook opens the fish and here is the ring. And Polycrates, who is actually now is even so much more proud because, you know, obviously gods are on his side writes this story to, to the pharaoh. And pharaoh replies, say, well, I can no longer be your friend because you are doomed. <laughs> and uh, he was doomed. He was invited by a Persian governor to come and celebrate a feast. Uh, instead of celebrating a feast, he was crucified. So that was the end of his, his, his life. So in any case, Pythagoras was there right during the reign of Polycrates and by all accounts was one of the favorites. And whatever we know, sort of there are multiple snippets which propagate through centuries. He was a very, very talented youth. He was physically very strong, won a wrestling competition during the Olympics. So, handsome guy, very intelligent. But he had something nagging inside him. He wanted to find wisdom. Sort of, he invented the term, which you take for granted, called 
philosophy, the love of wisdom. So he decided that the love of wisdom is very important, and in order to acquire it, you have to go and learn from somebody else. Sort of, this is very, you know, nowadays you encounter people who know that they are the source of wisdom. They don't need to learn. Uh, he realized that he needed to go. So the first thing, where does he go? If you know ge geography, you know that Samos is located right next to Milet Miletus. Do you remember who lives in Miletus roughly at that time? There's another thing. Thales. So he goes to Thales, and Thales tells him that, first of all, there is this theorem I discovered and the other stuff, and go to the Egyptians. So he clearly follows him advice, goes to the Egyptians, spends seven, eight years, eventually sort of gets accepted to, to be sort of disciple of some priestly group and studies with them for many years. Then a terrible thing, seemingly terrible thing happens. There is a Persian invasion. Persia, right at the time, becomes this great superpower which overwhelms this entire, entire region. We will see in a you know, few years how this great power is going to attack those upstart Greeks. Many good things happen there. But so at that time, the Persian power goes and takes over Egypt. Much juicier prize, rich. And in the meanwhile, Pythagoras is taken by the Persian military as a prisoner and brought to Babylon, where he spends some time studying with Babylonian priests. Again, he loved to study. And then I could tell you something for which I have no his direct historical evidence. I'm actually certain that he goes to India. And I'm not certain, but I really wish. I think he, he meets somebody in India. Whom would you meet in India at that time frame? Gautam, not yours. Gautam Buddha. Right? And why would I think so? Why do I think that Pythagoras met Buddha? Because you see, he comes back eventually from all these travels, he comes back with a bunch of very strange non-Greek ideas. He says, first of all, that we should not kill any animal. Why? Because it could be your grandmother. He takes it very seriously. So the notion of transmigration of souls, reincarnation, becomes central, utterly unknown to the Greeks prior to that. He says we should never eat meat. Again, could you imagine Greeks, even today, not eating meat, or anybody in the Mediterranean? No meat. He does astonishing thing. He says, let us create at what you would call today an ashram. That is, let us all come together and lead this life of poverty, chastity, and obedience together. Women are admitted, but not for some reasons. It's an amazing thing. Women become equal members of the Pythagorean Brotherhood. It's an amazing ashram. Before I tell you what they do in the ashram, which is the, the central question, that's where the, the key is. This is why we need to know about it. I have to tell you what happens. Where does he start his ashram? In Croton, in southern Italy. At that time, it's called Grecia, Grecia, Mania, Great Greece. There are many colonies of Greek cities located there. Three more minutes. Uh, and uh, so he goes there, starts the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood becomes very successful, acquires political power because they want to use philosophy to govern the state. And he gets killed by angry populace because apparently populace do not, does not want philosophers to govern them. This is an interesting sort of twist. So when you come back after the break, we will see what did they study at the ashram.